rugged, wind-torn collection of islands lies midway between Norway and the North Pole, the Norwegian archipelago of Svalbard. Svalbard is not just remote, it's completely isolated. There are no trees, and it's covered in snow and ice most of the year. These islands are home to the northernmost settlement on the planet, only a few hundred miles away from the North Pole. The largest island in the chain is Spitsbergen, which harbors the small inlet of Kings Bay, known for its raw and untouched beauty. Intrepid tourists love to make the journey there by boat or by plane. Just off the rocky beach, visitors to Kings Bay are greeted by a strange sight. Looming over the grassland behind the beach stands a solitary metal tower balanced on three legs. It's about 10 stories tall and tapered at the top like a mini Eiffel Tower. On this windswept, snowy beach, a metal tower feels oddly out of place. What is it doing here? It's 115 feet tall and 20 feet wide at the base. Running straight up the middle is a large ladder leading to a circular railed platform at the top. The extreme climate and remote location suggests that it could have been an old weather tower, but who would have built it? Historically, Denmark and Norway controlled Svalbard, but by 1941, the islands had fallen to Nazi Germany. During World War II, the Svalbard archipelago became a strategic stronghold. Weather stations on the island were critical to planning flights and convoys. Whoever controlled the region would have a significant advantage in the war. The Nazis had set up a number of manned and unmanned weather stations all across the Arctic, ensuring that they had access to the most accurate weather forecasts. Could this structure in Kings Bay be a forgotten Nazi weather tower? These weather stations were normally powered by multiple enormous batteries and huge metal canisters. But here in Kings Bay, it's just the tower. There's no enormous batteries or monitoring equipment of any kind. At first glance, the tower appears to be a simple structure. But looking closely at the design, certain details show that the engineering is actually quite complex. The most stable kind of shape is a triangle. They can hold a lot of weight. So the iron triangles holding up this structure would be incredibly strong. They'd be able to hold up exceptionally heavy loads. The base is an equilateral triangle. Each side is 20 feet wide. For a tower this tall, that design plus the tripod structure makes this much more resistant to tipping. That's critical in such a windy, stormy place. The legs of the tower are deeply cemented into a 40-ton concrete block, fixing them firmly into the frozen ground. Whatever this tower is, it was built to withstand a lot of weight and a lot of movement. Interestingly, the top part of the tower has a large rotating mechanism with a socket hole running through it. This suggests that something would have been attached to the top that could rotate around the tower. This type of rotating fastening system looks remarkably similar to those used for mooring airships, those huge floating machines like the Goodyear Blimp or the Hindenburg. Hangar 1 at Moffett Field, California, and a hangar at RAF Cardington in England both had these mechanisms on their airship mooring masts. Thick ropes attached to the nose cone of an airship would fasten to a socket on the tower. The airship was then secured in one place and could rotate with the direction of the wind, like a flag or weather vane. Airships had their heyday in the 1920s and 1930s, but they were difficult to maneuver even in the best conditions and could be very dangerous. If this is a mooring mast, what was an airship doing in the freezing climate of the Arctic? The 20s were the tail end of the heroic age of exploration. This was a period of worldwide excitement. New technologies had made reaching the furthest parts of the Earth suddenly possible. Explorers desperately wanted to cement their legacies and be the first to plant their flags in the world's most remote places. By 1911, the South Pole had already been reached by a charismatic Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen. But in the mid-1920s, the North Pole was still anyone's game. 
100 years ago, the sea ice near the North Pole was completely impenetrable. No ships could even get close to it. And making the trek on foot, with the equipment they had at the time, was impossible. Explorer Roald Amundsen tried and failed on two separate occasions to reach the North Pole by airplane. To this guy, this was just a minor setback. And by 1926, he had hatched another plan for an expedition. He was going to go by airship. Unlike planes, airships seemed like the perfect vehicle for Arctic travel. They could stay in the air for days, and you could do repairs in the air without having to attempt a potentially fatal landing on the cracked and dangerous ice. For the expedition, Amundsen bought a state-of-the-art airship. It was designed specifically for Arctic travel by an eccentric Italian engineer named Umberto Nobile. The airship was almost 350 feet long and 65 feet wide. It was powered by three 245 horsepower engines with a top speed of 49 miles an hour. The lift was provided by almost 70,000 cubic feet of hydrogen gas. But this new technology carried a risk. While airships could travel long distances, the flammable gas and powerful Arctic winds meant any journey could still end in disaster. Amundsen called it Norge, after his home country. The plan was to leave from northern Norway, fly across the ocean, Svalbard, refuel, and wait for the perfect conditions to begin his polar adventure. Could this tower in Kings Bay be the exact spot where Amundsen began his expedition in 1926? Historic photographs of the expedition reveal images of the Norga, somewhere in Svalbard attached to a giant tower, just like the one in Kings Bay. But in the photographs beside the tower, there's a colossal structure, even larger than the airship itself. What was it for? The Norgay needed a space for protection against the Arctic weather. So Amundsen had a huge hangar built to house the airship. It was an incredible architectural achievement and one of the largest hangars of its kind. Building in the Arctic is challenging at the best of times, but completing this in the 1920s during winter is an incredible feat. Over 16 miles of wooden beams were used in the construction of the hangar and parts and supplies for the 100-foot-high walls were imported from as far away as Rome. To complete the hangar in time for the Norga's arrival, 32 builders worked in extreme Arctic winter conditions and blanketed in 24-hour total darkness. If this tower in Kings Bay was the mooring mast for the Norga, you'd expect to see at least some remnants of this impressive hangar. But the mooring tower seems to be the only thing here. A building that enormous couldn't just vanish without a trace. What happened to it? A broader sweep of the Barren Island reveals the remains of several concrete pads in the snow just beyond the tower, each embedded with a number of large iron rings. The concrete pads are spread across an area the size of a football field. These look like the foundations of an absolutely enormous structure. The exterior of the Norga's hangar was covered in thousands of feet of canvas, tied to the frames and fastened to the foundations using these iron rings. The solitary mooring tower and the evidence of the foundation both indicate that this is in fact the place where Amundsen began his epic flight to the North Pole. In mid-May 1926, the Norga was transferred from the hangar to a mooring tower, where final preparations were made before its flight across the North Pole. On board along with the crew were Roald Amundsen, his American financer, and the ship's pilot and designer, Umberto Nobile. After a 16-hour flight, the Norga floated across the North Pole. Norwegian, American, and Italian flags were dropped in celebration before the giant airship completed its journey. But as they left, Amundsen noticed something on the ice below. The Italian flag that Nobile dropped was bigger than the other two flags, and Amundsen was furious with the Italian pilot. Despite the expedition's success, and Amundsen cementing his status as a legendary explorer, he just couldn't let that detail go. 
In his autobiography released the following year, Amundsen called Nobile a vain, arrogant, and boastful man who had no business being in the Arctic, because he couldn't even ski. This was an intense and bitter rivalry, fueled at least in part by Amundsen's arrogance. Nobile was no better. He needed to prove his own worth as an explorer and be the first to set foot at, not just fly over, the North Pole. Umberto Nobili returned to Kings Bay in 1928 with a nearly identical airship to the Norga. His new ship was called the Italia. But it was a total disaster. Nobile did reach the North Pole, but ended up crashing the Italia on the remote sea ice on their return. The gondola was crushed and ripped off the airship. Nobile and eight of the other men on board managed to escape the crash and await rescue. But as they did, the wind picked up the Italia, along with the six crew members still on board. And tragically, it carried them and the airship out into the Arctic, never to be seen again. The remaining crew had to wait for a potential rescue out on the ice, surviving only on what little resources had been left from the crash. Search parties were sent out to look for them. And who did they call out of retirement to aid in the search and rescue operation? The world's greatest Arctic pilot, Roald Amundsen. But during the search and rescue mission, tragedy struck once again. Amundsen's plane crashed and vanished somewhere in the Arctic. While Nobile was rescued by another plane and survived the humiliating ordeal, Amundsen's body and plane have never been found. This titan of polar exploration lies permanently below the ice, somewhere near the North Pole. Over the years, the giant timber hangar was dismantled and salvaged for parts in local projects like bridges and railways. And it left almost no trace of the history of this place. This metal tower and the hangar foundations are the only remaining evidence of an incredibly vibrant time in exploring the Arctic silently commemorating one of the great legends of the heroic age of exploration.